I am so excited that I get to talk to you about Jesus today. Amen. What an honor to talk to you about Jesus today. Uh, again, uh, I, um, let me get situated here for a sec, sorry. Um, I've been listening to this song all week and it just got in my spirit and uh, oftentimes the way I work and put messages together, I have to be inspired. I have to be inspired by something. If not, then, um, you know, I could still preach, but I love preaching with passion. I love preaching with my heart and that's the way my, my style is. If something has to move me. Uh, if not, it just comes from my head. And so this song got in my, my spirit, especially something that I'm believing God for in my life and with my family. And that I just believed that God was going to make a way. So I just want to share with you a couple of scriptures. And I want to talk to you about a God that will make a way. He's a way-making God. Isaiah 43 in verse 18 and 19 says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing now, it shall spring forth, and you shall know it. I will even make, here's the word, I will make a way in your wilderness right now. In this uncomfortable, unlike place you, that's going on in your life, I'm going to make a way. And rivers in your deserts. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation is overtaking you. No struggle or trial in your life that you're going through. No temptation is going to over, has overtaken you except such as common to man. So many times when we're going through things, we want to believe that we're the only one. And God said, no, there's someone else that has experienced and I have helped them through. It says, except such as common to man. But God is faithful. That's the key word there. God is faithful. Can you say that with me? God is faithful. No matter what it looks like, God is still faithful. And the devil is going to lie to you and tell you that God isn't faithful. But you need to know that God is faithful. It goes on and says, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but with that temptation will also make, here it is again, a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You may not be able to see that way of escape today, but there is a way of escape and God will reveal that way of escape to you. You know... <clears throat> Excuse me. Are we okay? Yes. I'm okay. Um, in um, January of 1994, I was at a big, big O tire store putting tires on my pastor's car for them. And I was thumbing through a Christian book, and uh, there were some scriptures in this Christian book. And one particular scripture that we just read, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, jumped off the pages of that book. I thought to myself, wow, that's just a great scripture. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, saith the Lord. I'll make a way in your wilderness, rivers in your dead. What a beautiful scripture. But little did I know what the next three months would look like. Because in the next three months, I would hear God say, I've called you to be a senior pastor now. You've been in this house for 15 years. Now I've called you to be a senior pastor. Then I'd go a few days or a few weeks, and I'd just come back and say, senior pastor. I feel that in my spirit, senior pastor, senior pastor. And then I went, as you know, to my senior pastor, and I told them, and they said, we'll pray about it and come back tomorrow, and we'll talk about it. When I came back the next day, I'm not exaggerating, all my stuff of nine years full time was put in a box in, from my office desk. They cleared out my desk. They handed my box to me. Uh, they gave me one week's of already earned paid vacation and said, we don't have enough to pay you your second week of vacation. We'll mail it to you. If you would like to write a letter to the congregation telling them why you're leaving, you can. And that was it. Well, you know what? I didn't have a, I had already that year because there were, I, I had made $48,000 uh, as a, an assistant pastor. In January, they told me that uh, because of financial uh, crisis, we're going to have to eliminate 18000 So I was making 30000 That was okay. I wasn't in ministry for money. I was just as content as can be. And I went and found a job working at a parcel service. 
and uh, that would make the up the 18,000. Well, this day that I'm talking about, $30,000 was removed from my income. How do you live off of $18,000 with a mortgage and three kids? Please tell me how you do that. I was in a predicament that I did not expect. How was God going to make a way in this situation? Let alone losing $30,000, not knowing where the income was going to come from. Yet the complexity of me wanting to be a senior pastor, thinking that that was still going to be a year away, that preparation and planning. Because I didn't know. There wasn't all these research. There wasn't the internet. You couldn't go on. You couldn't buy books. How to start a church. How to grow a church. How to market a church. There wasn't a available back then and I was not educated in that I was overwhelmed but look at where we are nearly 25 years later I'm here to tell you in the midst of my crisis God made a way now listen this is a great message because in a few moments I'm going to start preaching and I'm going to preach loud and I'm going to preach hard about God made a way for David when he stood in front of Goliath. God made a way in Moses when the Red Sea was divided. God made a way for Hannah when she was in her, didn't, couldn't bear anyone. God made a way in Joseph when he was in the prison. God, you know, we're going to get excited. We're going to start claiming that. But listen, I've been doing this too long. I, want, I don't want you to claim a promise. I want you to know how to get the promise. I'm tired of being stirred up till I get to the parking lot. My marriage is jacked up. My finances are jacked up. I'm an emotional distraught. I've got pornography addictions, lust a different distance. So how really, I appreciate you telling me that God's going to make a way, but it surely has not made a way in my life yet. I'm going to tell you how God's going to make a way. How do these things happen where God literally makes a way in our lives? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you did not see a way out of the marriage conflict or the financial conflict or the mental battle or the health issues or the lawsuit or the judgments in our lives? Have you ever said this is a no way out situation where you have felt cornered, hemmed in, and boxed in? Because of the record you're facing, because of the reputation you have, because of the report that's been given to you, or the resistance that's coming against you, or the reoccurrence that is going on in your life. There's an individual by the name of Bill Robinson. He, is the long, he has the world's record, if you want to call it that, of being a POW held in captive. In... Uh, September the 20th, 1965, his plane was shot down in the Vietnam War. And then he was released in February 12, 1973. He was over seven years a POW, a prisoner of war. He was hog, hogtied every day. No food virtually, no electricity, no toilet, no water. Solidary confinement for 10 years of his life. He's in a no way situation. But here's his quote. The thing that kept us going to that point was faith. Faith in myself that I could handle things. Faith in those around us that we could get through this together. Faith in my country that they would not abandon me, but most of all, faith in God that he would see me through, Robinson said. To be a captive of war in prison for seven years, how does someone survive that? And then go on to live a fruitful life. Someone who learns this, to trust God, that God is going to make a way. That nothing is catching God off guard or by accident or by chance. If I really believe that God is a faithful God, then I'm going to believe that no matter what it looks like, God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. And that's what you need to tell yourself repeatedly when you're going through difficult and hard times. God is in control. And if God is in control, God is going to make a way of escape. There's going to be a deliverance. You know, I grew up in the, uh, I grew up in the 60s, and I love to watch the original uh, Batman and Robin show. The Cape Crusaders, and they'd be fighting against, you know, Catwoman or the Riddler or 
you know, the Iceman or whoever it was, the Joker, and they'd be trapped. They'd be trapped over some fire, some boiling water, and the announcer would come on and say, can the Great Cape Crusaders survive this tragedy that the Riddler is about ready to destroy them? Will mankind be able to live without our heroes? Stay tuned, and we will come back after the commercial to see what happens. And so the commercial would come back, And all of a sudden, there was a way of escape that wasn't there before the commercial. There was some lever, there was something on the belt, there was some rope that they saw, and it provided a way of escape so that the enemy would not prevail. And that's the kind of God that we serve. God is a God that makes a way of escape. And he has a reputation. The Bible says this, I will go before you and I will make the crooked places straight. Do you have any crooked places in your life? And I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and I will cut the bars of iron. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill will be brought low because God's going to make a way. And the crooked places in your life are going to be made straight. And the rough places of your life are going to be made smooth. Four things that God can do because we serve a God that can make a way. There are no obstacles. Now I'm going to preach. I'm going to get ready for you to preach now. Just for a moment, if you'll let me look at my notes, I want to preach just for a moment. I want you to recognize there's no obstacles that God cannot remove. There are no rejections that he cannot change. There are no denials that he cannot fix. There are no limitations that he cannot lift. There are no objections that he cannot put away. There are no hindrances that he cannot take away. There's no resistance that he cannot destroy. There's no barriers that he can't tear down. There's no noise that he cannot silence. There's no shout that he cannot hush. There's no restlessness that he cannot bring ease to. There's no weariness or worriness that he cannot bring peace to. There is no fear in your life that he cannot stop. There is no door that he cannot open. There is no code that he cannot break. There is no chain that he cannot destroy. There is no wall that cannot come down. There is no lie that he cannot change. There is no past that cannot be healed. There is no hurt that cannot be helped. There is no pain that cannot be fixed. He can still a storm. He can change water into wine. He could feed 5,000. He can walk on water. He can make an axe float. He can cause the sun to stand still. He can cause the Red Seas to divide. He can cast out devils. He can heal the sick and he can raise the dead. We serve a God that can make a way. When mankind was hopeless because we were sinners damned to go to hell, God made a way through Jesus Christ. He made a way through the cross. He made a way through redemption. He made a way through sacrifice. We were enemies. We were pilgrims. We were victims. We were cursed. We were bound by sin and we were bound by disobedience. But God made a way through Jesus Christ. He became our propitiation. He became our sanctification. He became our sacrifice. Jesus made a way. The Bible says, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the, according to the riches of his grace. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, and he himself is the propitiation, which means the sacrifice for our sins, and not only, but the whole world. Jesus paid the price. You know, if the Hulk could smash, how much more can Christ? If Thor has a hammer that can destroy things, how much more can God? You know, again, I grew up in the 60s, and one of my favorite cartoons was Felix the Cat, the wonderful, wonderful cat, a bag of tricks. And there was a character that was his friend. His name was Vavum. 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 See, Felix be between a rock and a hard place, and he'd be with Vavum. And there was no way to get the barrier that was in front of them, may it be a mountain or an obstacle, to be removed. And he look at Vavum, and Vavum go with his mouth like this. Vavum! Vavum! 
Vaboom! And everything that was in front of them was destroyed. How much more when God speaks a word out of his mouth that you speak from scriptures out of your mouth cause a vavoom to take place in your life. Things have got to change in your life. When you speak God's word, there's a vavoom that takes place. You know, it's said that a bulldozer can literally remove any obstacle that's in front of it. The biggest uh, bulldozer is one produced out of Italy. It has 1,350 horsepower and weighs 183 tons. Uh, tons. Is, the blade is 23 feet wide and nine feet tall. It's virtually impossible for any object to stand in front of it. It just bulldozes over it. Artica is a Russian icebreaker. There was a time uh, in the North Pole, Antarctica, certain areas uh, where it would freeze. And literally, you could not do anything when the waters, the seas, and the lakes froze. It was inhabitable. You couldn't go forward. And then these ice-breaking ships, modern marvels, began to be built that would crack through these ices to pave a way. The biggest one is this Artica, and what it is, it's run by two nuclear reactors, and it compounds through the deepest ice of 13 feet deep. I just want you to know that you serve a God that is way more than enough. He makes a way where there is no other way. I know what that's like in my life. I just shared it with you. But another time in my life, uh, I, I was running marathons this particular year. I had run four marathons in one year. I had uh, qualified for Boston because you can't just run Boston. You have to qualify for Boston. You have to meet a standard to be invited. It's the oldest marathon in the world. And the most elite uh, marathoners show up for this marathon at Boston. I qualified and I ran Boston. But I heard a lot when I ran it, and I didn't understand it. And we went through different types of sports doctors and different type of x-rays, and we couldn't find anything until one day we had a CAT scan done. And that CAT scan revealed that I had a tumor and I had kidney cancer stage four. I had that right kidney removed. It's gone. There's nothing there anymore. You know what? I needed a God to make a way. I had experienced God healing me of certain illnesses and sicknesses and helping me through troubles and adversities, but I had never faced terminal cancer. I had never heard a doctor tell me these words and I didn't know how to understand it. Go home and set your affairs in order. Who hears that? Who hears that when you're 47 years old and you just ran four marathons? What are you talking about? The second thing he said to me is don't make no long-term commitments. What are you saying to me? That's not a vocabulary that's common in our languages we have. But I want you to know that no matter what the report was and no matter the bad news that I had heard and no matter the fear that overtook me today, that day, I had to believe that God would provide a way of escape. And I had to believe that God was going to make a way where there is no other way. So I want to look at Genesis 22, and I want to look at the life of Abraham. Last week we shared about Abraham and how him and Sarah believed God in the barrenness of their situation to give birth to a son called Isaac. Now we're going to look at Isaac in another time that God needs, excuse me, Abraham needs God to make a way in his life. Because he doesn't know how this sacrificing, killing a son, when you promised me an heir and through my loins would come a generation far greater than the stars of the air and, and in the sand, and now you're asking me to kill that son? That doesn't make sense. So I really need you to make a way if I'm going to have a destiny, if, if I'm going to have a dream, and I'm going to see this promise fulfilled, you're going to have to make a way. Because right now, God, what you're asking me of me does not make sense. I can't figure it out. I need you to make a way. So it says in Genesis 22, 1, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. We could read these so quickly and not get the revelation in it. It's just so powerful. God tested Abraham. 
Did God test Abraham so that he'd fail? No, God tested Abraham so he'd pass. Did God not know that Abraham would pass? Yes, God knew he would pass, but he needed Abraham to know he was going to pass. Now, don't get tripped up on the word test. Just exchange the word test if it bothers you for ask. Because that's what, when God asks you to do something, it's a test. It's a test whether he's Lord over your life, whether you'll follow him or not. So if you don't like the word test because it just doesn't fit, you know, with your theology, then just put the word ask. But it says here, God asked him to do something. And I love Abraham's response. He doesn't say what modern Christians say or what your children say when you ask them for something. What do you want? Because that's the way most children respond to their parents, right? At least my kids did when they were young. And we do the same thing to God. And, but I love Abraham. He says, here I am. He's basically saying, yes, God. God didn't even ask him, and he's already saying yes. Could we get to a, a place in our life with Christ that the moment he asks, we just say yes? What is it? Yes. It, you don't have to explain. It, just tell me what you want. My answer to you is yes. Now, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. It goes on and it says, then he said, take your, look at the emotion. Do, do not look at this as something simple. Take now your son, your only son, that son that you love, and go to the land of Moriah, the place that David bought as a sacrifice, the place that thousands of years later, Jesus would die on a cross. There's always a meaning behind what God is doing. There's always significance behind what God is doing. It may not sense to you, but it makes sense to God from his aerial perspective. And it goes on and says, so Abraham rose up early. You would have thought that he would have slept in that day. Because most of us, well, you know, God, I meant to tithe today. I, I, I meant to witness. I meant to pray. <laughs> you know, look. when God asks you to sacrifice your son, are you going to get up early to do it? This shows you why this guy is going to experience a way. This shows us why we don't experience a God that can make a way. So he goes on and says he rose up early. He got a couple servants with him. It took him three days to go on this journey. Then verse 5, it says, So Abraham said to the young men, his servants that were with him, Stay here with the donkeys, and I and the lad will go yonder. We're going to climb this mountain, and we're going to worship, and we will come back to you. What do you mean you're going to come back? God told you that son's going to die. Why are you saying we're going to come back? So Abraham, he took the wood and the offering, he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand. He ain't messing, there's full of details here. He can't go up there and say, oops, I forgot the fire, God. <laughs> I meant to, I mean, I really meant, really meant to live holy today. He says here, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire, the wood, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? See, he's not a stupid kid. He's a teenager right now. He's putting one to one together. He's saying, okay, you're going to go sacrifice. I see the fire. I see the wood. But normally we sacrifice an animal. I don't see no animal. There's me and there's you. He says in verse number eight, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb. Wait a minute, this does not, did you not hear what God said, Abraham? God said to kill your son, sacrifice your son. Why is he talking the way he's talking? Does he know something about God's character that you and I don't know? That God can't lie. That God is faithful. He promised me a son. So if I have to kill this son, then God has got to raise him from the dead because there's an heir that I've got that's got to come forth. I don't know how God's going to make a way. I don't know how God's going to make a way. So he go, they go a little further. In verse number 11, he raises his knife to about ready to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called to, from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. There he is. Yes. He said, do not lay your hand on your lad nor do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son. So you can't withhold anything from God. Don't, then you don't think God's bigger than that. I don't know how people can't give financially to God. 
they withhold it. Or whatever God's challenging us to do, your, your son, your only son. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes. I love this, this is the most powerful verse to me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes because he didn't see it before. Or all of a sudden it wasn't, it wasn't there. Poof, there it is. And there behind him was a ram caught in the thickets by its horns. So Abraham went, where did this ram come from? What did, what did Abraham tell, say was gonna happen? God's gonna provide a lamb. And he sacrifices, sacrifices that lamb. And he says in verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide or Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Amen. God made a way, he provided for me. I didn't have to kill my son. God provided something for me and I didn't know it at that time, couldn't see it. Here are four things that I wanna share with you today about Abraham, <coughs> Abraham's experience. do is I don't use breath mints because I don't need no I'm just kidding I don't I don't use breath mints I use uh, cloves the kind of cloves that you cook with and I put them in my mouth and I put them and I just let them soak and sometimes it gets stuck in my throat so I, so I took it too close to me preaching when during worship it was there, that's what, that's what I'm dealing with today. That I, I could see you wanted to know that. And <laughs> God made a way to resolve Abraham's dilemma, to bring resolution to his predicament, to revive his dreams and hopes, to reconcile his emotions, and to reestablish the vision in his heart. And God will do the same thing for you. The first thing I want you to recognize, if you're going to experience a God that makes a way in your life like Abraham, then you need to know this, that God makes a way when you believe that he can make a way. You've got to believe. Someone can't believe for you. You've got to believe for yourself. And in this verse, you see Abraham believe for himself. The Lord will provide. Me and the lad will come back. Yes, Lord, what do you want me to do, basically? He believed for himself. And so to experience a God that makes a way, you've got to believe that God is going to make a way. No matter what the stats say, no matter what the statistics say, no matter what the odds say, no matter what your TRW says, no matter what the credit rating says, no matter what anyone says, you've got to believe that God can make a way no matter what I'm facing today. Again, if he made a way for David... To overcome Goliath and he made a way for Peter to escape the prison and he made a way for Paul and Silas when they were in prison and Israel and Pharaoh and the Red Sea and Paul and 276 people were saved as they were on their way to Rome in the shipwreck and Hannah in her barrenness and Queen Esther out of all the women to become queen why is this Jewish peasant woman going to be chosen because God God made a way. How is a widow who just lost her husband, who has no money, but the prophet comes and says, what do you have in your house? She says, I just have a little bottle of oil. And she says to her, go borrow every vessel that you could find and pour that little oil in those vessels. And supernaturally, God made a way and filled all those vessels. And she paid off all her debt. And she lived the rest of her life as an oil tycoon. God made a way where there is no other way. God made a way for that baby Joseph when there was a child massacre going on. It just so happened that she put the baby in the Nile River and it just so happened that the daughter of Pharaoh was bathing and it just so happened that the current of the water floated baby Moses to the uh, daughter of Pharaoh and it just so happened that there was a longing that she could not have a child that she adopts him and this child is saved. God made a way for, for that baby Moses. Moses. God made a way for Mary and Joseph to escape to Egypt 
with Jesus. God made a way with, for Jehoshaphat that was surrounded by armies that were bigger than him, Moab, Mount Seir, and Ammon. But God delivered them that day. And you've got to believe that God is going to make a way for you. How do you get to that place? How? You say, preacher, it's wonderful that you believe that, but I don't believe that. I don't really believe that God is going to make a way. Do you understand what my husband said to me? Do you understand what the doctor said to me? Do you understand how many medications I'm taking? Well, here's what you need to know if you're going to believe God. You got to get into God's word and you got to hold fast to scriptures and you got to believe that the Bible is true. That's how you get to the place because the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, watch this, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You will never have faith to believe that God will make a way unless you absorb yourself in scriptures because every scripture that you read, every scripture that you meditate on, and every scripture that you confess begins to raise the water tide of your faith and it gets stronger and it gets stronger and it gets stronger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets greater and it gets greater. So one day you'll say, I will live and not die and declare the glory of the Lord and God will heal me of cancer. That doesn't come overnight. You gotta fight the good fight of faith. You gotta believe God when everything around you is going south. Amen. How do you get to that? Diego, it's wonderful to hear your testimony. Stop that. Stop thinking Diego is greater than God pixie dust. God loves him more. No, I'm just a believer that God wants to happen for you today. He's not a respecter person. Get into the word of God, hold fast to a scripture and trust God. That's how you'll start believing. What has God told you about your circumstance? That it's never going to happen. You have no scripture to stand on. You have no word you're holding fast to. It's just an empty emotional belief. That's all it is. It's just a hype. You're just psyching yourself up. You're just like a secular motivational person. I believe I can. I can. I believe I can. I can. Well, when you're going against stage four cancer, believing I can, I can, is not enough. So I want you to recognize, you got to believe that God is in control. You got to believe that God is faithful. And you got to believe that God is going to favor you. You know, there was a man, and he was on the, 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 uh, he was on the lift going up, and he noticed about below him was two skiers. And uh, one had a vest on, but he couldn't read it because he was a little distance away as he was going up. And uh, he noticed the, the, the one uh, shouting out commands, left, right, his guide, left, right, his guide. The instructor was saying that. So he thought he'd make a joke, and whatever the instructor say, he'd say the opposite. Left, he'd say right, right, left, stop, he'd say go. So at the end of the day, they went back to the mountain lodge, and he noticed those two individuals, and he thought he'd go up to them and just kind of jokingly apologize. But what he was amazed that he remembered was when he yelled out a command, the guy never listened to him. Never listened to him. So he went up there and said, you know what, I just want to know. I was playing a joke. I'm sorry about it. I'm the guy on the lift that was yelling out the opposite of your commands. But I'm amazed because you're just like a, a, a beginner uh, uh, skier, and you did not listen to my commands when I told you. And he looked at him and he recognized the guy who he was talking to was blind. And he said, I didn't listen to you because you're not my instructor. You're, you're not the voice that I follow. I only follow the voice of my instructor. And when people are shouting out to you on how to make a choice and how to make a decision and do this and do that, you got to know the voice of your instructor, the word of God, the father, the Holy Spirit. And you got to only follow his voice. The second thing, if you want God to make a way in your life, is you got to believe this. God makes a way when you get out of the way. Now, if you want to run around the church seven times, shout hallelujah and throw your handkerchief up, I don't mind. But that's worth the dollar that you gave me today in the offering just to hear that. I'm joking with you. God will make a way when you get out of the way. And it's amazing how many people are in the way of God. 
Guys, I'm going to wake away, but if you just step aside, stop trying to tell me how to do. Stop trying to tell me about all the information, all the experience, all the research that you've done on the internet. Stop trying to tell me how to change your husband. So, you know, stop telling me how to save your kids. And do I know what they're doing and what they did last night? I know what I'm doing. Just get out of the way. Take your hands off of Isaac and offer him up to me. I know what I'm doing. You got to get out of the way. Jonah is in the way of God. And that's why he's experiencing hardships in the, in the belly of the fish. There's a, there's a reason why sometimes people experience hardships. Because they're out of the way of where God wants them to be. They're in God's way of what God wants to do. But notice this. When Jonah repents... God tells the fish to spit him up and all his suffering ends. When you get out of the way of God, then you start getting in the way God wants you to be. So I want you to recognize you and I have to get out of the way. Just get out of the way completely. I want you to recognize uh, you, you don't need to discuss, have a meeting, or have God explain to you. I just love how Abraham does this. Abraham just says, yes, Lord, yes, yes. He's not going to get in God's way. He doesn't need a discussion. He doesn't have to give God his opinion. He doesn't have to have a dialogue. He doesn't have to, you know, share information. And we, why God? Why do you want me to do it? Why God? Let's sit down and talk about it, God. I'm not. He doesn't do all that. He doesn't get in the way of God. And you and I cannot get in the way of God. Here's how people get in the way of God. They're fighting with God. Uh, They're fearful of what God is asking them to do, and they're flighty. Three ways that people get in the way of what God wants to do, they're fighting against God. They're fighting with their own logic, and they're fighting with anger. They're, They're individuals that are fearful. They can't trust, and they believe that God is not bigger than the situation, so they're in the way of God. And they're flighty. They have a quitting spirit and a quitting attitude and they're full of negativity. Three F's that will have you in the way of what God wants you to do. You know, it's amazing how my wife Cindy will cook better when I'll get out of the kitchen. How many of you ever heard that statement, there can't be two cooks in the kitchen? Tell me what happens when there's two cooks in the kitchen. Two opinions, somebody tell, too much salt, not enough pepper, cooked it too long, twisted here, do this, do that. But it's amazing how my meal goes faster if I'll just get out of the kitchen. And God says, I know what I'm doing, get out of the kitchen. When I need you to do something, I'll ask you to come over here, but right now, I don't need your help. And so many of you are in the way of your children that God can't reach them. Turn him over to God, just the way the father did with the prodigal. He's not worried about him. He ain't following him around. He's not talking about, he doesn't even know all that's going on. It's the older brother that knows the details, the day-to-day stuff, because he's going to gossip about it. You know, he's a a busybody, a nosy body. But the father, he doesn't need to know uh, day-to-day. He just knows that he left, he's away from me, but he's going to return. And that's what you got to do. You got to get out of the way of God. You got to take your hands off of your children. You got to take your hands off of your, stop nagging. Stop, well, then pick up after yourself. Clean this. Stop doing that. Just say, God, I give this man over to you. God, I give this woman over to you today, God. I'm going to get out of the way. I'm just going to get out of the way. Some of us need just simply to get out of the way. Tell somebody, get out of the way. Now, I, uh, three to four times a week, um, I have uh, three labs. I have three labs, two chocolates, and I have uh, a yellow lab. Uh, but then uh, I'm babysitting Adam's dogs, and Adam has a golden retriever, and he has a golden uh, doodle. And so I take these dogs on walks. Now, when, the moment I go to the leash, oh, my God. They're, they go crazy. Their tails are wagging. They're hitting each other. They're, they, they don't understand. If they don't line up, I can't move forward and take them out of the gate. They're wild. But if they'll let me lead, look at how calm they are. I can control five dogs. As calm as can be. But they got to get out of my way. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. Let me take my position and let me lead. 
And we'll get to the open field where you want to run wild and run after, you know, rabbits and birds and coyotes. We're going to get there. But let me lead you. And so many of us, God can't make a way because you're in his way. You're just in his way. So we got to get out of the way. If we're going to see God make a way, then we got to do it his way. We got to do it his way. God says in the scriptures that Abraham rose up early. He took the wood and he was about ready to slay his son. God makes a way when we do it his way. God is a God of details, specifics, directions, and directives. And everything that Abraham does here to see that God's going to make a way is that he's going to do it God's way. He's going to do exactly what God told him to do. He's going to go to the land of Moriah. You know, he could have said, you know what? That's so far. Let me just go over to Mount Baldy. I can get to Mount Baldy in an hour. Mount Baldy, Mount Moriah, who gives a heck? God says, I want Mount Moriah because my son is going to be sacrificed a couple thousand years later on that hill. So you want to do it our way. We want to pick and choose what we want to do. He's going to do exactly what God told him to do. And so if you want it, and I want to see God make a way, you got to do exactly what God asks us to do. You can't change it, you can't vary it, you can't give your interpretation. So there's a seriousness and an urgency that needs to be in our lives. There's a diligence and a determination to do it God's way. And there's an obedience and there is a submission that's being done. God says, I want you to carry the Ark of the Covenant, but no man can touch the Ark of the Covenant. You touch the Ark of the Covenant and you're going to die. Someone touches the Ark of the Covenant, they die. Come to join you, honey. They died. But God said there's rings on the side of the ark and you're to put poles there and that's the way you carry it because you're going to do it my way. I'm going to tell you that all the cities in the land of Canaan are yours. I'm going to give you the power to conquer them. But I want you to know the wealth of Jericho is mine. It's the tithe. Don't you touch it. They go to a little city called Ai and they get their butt whooped. And Joshua doesn't know why they got whooped when God made them a promise a breakthrough, miracles, and victories. But now they're experiencing defeat. And he goes for God for the answer. And God said, there's a guy named Achan. Go find him. He has stolen some wealth of, 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 uh, from, from Jericho. And that's why you can't overcome. God is a God of specifics. And if you want victory in your life, you're going to have to do it God's way. Naaman says, listen, I don't want to dip in no, 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 no muddy river, Jordan. I want to go to the cleaner rivers to remove my leprosy. God says, go, se- go over there seven times and dip. Do it God's way and you'll get God's results in your life. But you and I have to do it God's way. How many of you have ever tried to cook something, but you decided to do a substitute in the recipe for what you wanted? How many of you it turned out? Good. Not for me. I was baking cookies because there's these natural there's these natural cookies that I that I like and uh, so so I you know I didn't want to wait for Cindy. Cindy was getting the ingredients. She was she was busy that day. She probably babysitting or something like that with the herd that we have now. But anyways, <laughs> here's the totem pole in my relationship. Okay, first it's uh, it's the boys. Then it's the grandkids, and if there's any time left, there's me. Um, anyways, just joking. But anyways, not really. But anyways. Um, so I decide to make my own cookies. I've been waiting too long. I'm going to make my own natural cookies. My God, they were so yucky and so terrible. And I said, Cindy, why didn't they come out like yours? She said, did you follow the recipe? I said, no, I didn't follow the recipe. Because it said to stir. I said, what's so important about stirring? It's all going together. Just throw it together. It doesn't work. You got to follow God's Recipe. You got to do it God's way. Whatever God said, that's what you need to do. You need to do it God's way. Can you say amen? amen? So here's just some final thoughts that you need to know. Here's some thoughts you need to know about doing it God's way to experience it. Here's what you need to do. Choose your friends wisely. Abraham doesn't take a big group with him to the mountain because they're not going to understand what he's doing. Get your friends out of the way. That can call, number two, don't measure yourself by the stats. You'll, get, you'll never experience the way God wants. Next, 
Don't be discouraged because of how long it's taking. The next one, you have to ask yourself, have you done everything that's required and that you're responsible for doing? Many people do not receive a God that makes a way because they're not doing what God has asked them to do. That's why Abraham is doing everything God told him to do so he could stand before him and say, God, I did everything I was responsible for and I did everything that I was required to do. I ran out of time, but I'm going to try to give it to you really quick. When we were building this property, a guy named Jack Hawkins, a general contractor, came. He was a licensed, he owned his own helicopter. He said, would you like to fly above your property to see it? I said, yes, let's do it, Jack. We did it. Awesome thing. He said, anything where else you'd like to go? I said, yes, I run the trails up here. I like to go over there and see these trails. There's this one trail I can't reach. I've seen it from a distance. We went over there. He said, what else you want to do? I said, can we land up there? We landed. But here's what amazed me. Here's a guy that owns his own helicopter, been flying for 40 years. He went through the checklist to start it, to start the helicopter, which is common. But here's what he did. He got on the microphone or, or the PA system, whatever you call it, and he said, he called uh, Ontario Airport for permission to lift off the ground. It blew me away. He was entering the airspace of Ontario and he had to ask permission. And they said, where are you going? He told them. Then when we were over there, he said, can I have permission to land? They said, permission to land. How long will you be there? See, we just get up and we go wherever we want. We leave the church whenever we want. We marry whoever we want. We say our two cents whenever we want. And you never get permission. And that's why God never makes a way in your life. One more thing. Can you handle one more and I'm done? The last one is this. God makes a way when you can't always see the way. When there's, you can't figure it out, recognize it, or distinguish it, God makes a way. So when you can't figure it out, just be like Abraham. Just keep climbing the mountain, keep moving forward, and don't look back. Because here's the miraculousness of this situation. Here's the miraculous of this situation. As Abraham is marching up on one side of the mountain, guess what's marching up on the other side of the mountain? The ram. If Abraham turns around and goes back, then the ram goes back or he never meets his provision. And many of us never meet our, prov our provision because we're climbing the mountain and we don't see yet it. We get discouraged. We get tired. We quit. We listen to the lie of the devil. It's not working. And you got to keep moving forward and keep believing and trusting God even when you can't see it because there'll come a point when you meet Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, your provider, and something you couldn't see, you now see God made a way where there was no other way. So a couple of you know, whatever, eight years ago, nine years ago, when two of my sons left the ministry to go another church, I didn't know how God was going to make a way because they were very stout in what they believed. They were not going to come back. But God used a pain in both those, their lives to humble them and to bring them back. I didn't see that that was going to happen that day. When I said I'm going to go start a church, I didn't see. I thought I'd get a blessing. I thought I bought it for the people. I thought they would support me. I thought all these things. They, it, it, it hurt a lot. But it was God's way of saying, you're going to depend upon me. See, you don't think I'm in control, Diego, because you're experiencing pain. Who said you, have, you can't experience pain and be with God? I don't know where we come up with these beliefs. He said, you, when you experience that pain and you, when, when you lose your pastor and you lose your friends and you lose your income, you find me. I'm going to make a way where there is no other way when, you don't, when it won't make sense. When it doesn't make sense in your life. If you want the complete message, you'll have to come next, the, ne next service. But I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. See, sometimes we can't see our way through something. It's almost impossible. There's a roadblock in front of us. And we try with our horizontal strengths, looks, and giftedness to try to, re to try to get this thing to remove. And it just takes forever. And it's almost impossible to remove the obstacle in your life. You can't with your limited wisdom and smarts. But I want you to know there's a God that comes from the vertical position. And he's going to remove.
He's a God that makes a way. You can't see how it's going to be removed. You can't see it from your horizontal viewpoint. God sees vertically from top and looks down. And he says, with my mighty hand, I will deliver my people. Father, I just pray today that that message just is absorbed in people's spirits today. That no matter what they're facing today, you are a God that makes a way. Nobody is so hopeless and helpless, so boxed in and hemmed in God that you cannot provide a way of escape. But God, we got to get out of your way. And we got to start doing things your way. And we've got to start believing that you can make a way. And we've got to believe that no matter, even if it doesn't make sense, God, to keep moving forward, keep moving forward, keep moving forward. You're not going to be able to figure it out all the time. I just pray that you make a way in people's lives today where there is no other way but you. In Jesus' name, amen.